All right, thank you, Volkan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll present uh, the work of my uh, student, Quentin, who is right there. So if you have uh, the more advanced questions, you can keep right after as the guy with the coat. Um, and uh, this will be about uh, optimization, right? So more specifically, it's about unconstrained optimization, continuous. And even more specifically, uh, the story is going to be about the local behavior of algorithms, uh, standard algorithms, uh, in the case where, in the situation where um, the, the minima are not necessarily isolated, right? And this is where that's sort of going to be the strongest connection to machine learning, which is what this workshop is all about. It's quite simply that, uh, you know, in machine learning, it often is the case that the minimizers are not isolated. But for the rest of that, it's just going to be an optimization story, okay? Now, uh, to get started with the story, I'll go back all the way to the kinds of things you might hear in the, maybe uh, the second or the third lecture in an intro class to optimization, which is, you know, what could go wrong? And let's look at a very simple function, 1D, um, where there's just one minimizer, and it's actually isolated, it's unique, just f of x equals x to the power 4, okay, quartic, one-dimensional. Uh, this function is nice enough that you can compute its gradient, just a derivative, and the Hessian, just a second derivative. And uh, since everything is so explicit, you can actually write down what gradient descent would do for that function explicitly. And you get an expression for, you know, uh, xk plus one as a function of xk. You get this kind of behavior. And then uh, alpha is your step size. And if you pick your step size, you know, in, in, a, in a reasonable way, then you'll find that uh, for this particular function, gradient descent indeed converges where you want it to converge to the minimizer, but it does so at a sublinear rate which is you know, not what you would normally hope for when you, you know, consider a gradient descent method. And if you look at Newton's method, again, you can write things explicitly, and you find that indeed this will converge to the minimizer, but it will do so at a linear rate, which again is less than what you would normally hope for um, with a Newton method. Okay, and then if you know anything about optimization, then you know exactly uh, you know, what the issue is. The issue is that this particular function, it's a little bit too flat at the minimizer, uh, specifically, the Hessian, the second derivative of the function at the minimizer is zero. Uh, and of course, well, we know that the Hessian at the minimizer should be, um, you know, at least positive semi-definite. Uh, and here the issue is that it, it fails to be positive definite. Okay. Um, right. And in particular, if the Hessian were a positive definite, then you could open your favorite intro textbook to optimization, maybe, you know, no set and write, and you'd find all the standard convergence rates locally uh, around minimizers, uh, like a linear for gradient descent, uh, quadratic for Newton, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, um, the reason this is going to be an issue for the, the story uh, that I want to tell you today, which is about non-isolated minimizers, is that if your function, if your cost function is C2, and you consider a critical point, point where gradient is zero, x star, where the Hessian is positive definite, which is what you would have to assume in order to call upon the most classical results, uh, then it would necessarily turn out that this point x star not only is a local minimum, which is a good thing, but it's actually an isolated local minimum, right? Because the Hessian forces the function to, to curve up in all directions immediately. Uh, and therefore, if your Hessian is positive definite, your minimizer is certainly not isolated. Therefore, if you're interested in functions where the minimizers are not isolated, well, then you cannot assume that the Hessian is positive definite. So you need something different. Now, um, you know, why might it happen that the minimizers are uh, not isolated? This could come about for a number of reasons. I'll keep it brief, uh, just, you know, in the interest of time. But let me just mention again, in the, in the context of uh, machine learning, this might more typically come up because of overparameterization, right? You'd have a continuum of minimizers instead of just having one well-identified point, okay? Now, where the story becomes a bit more interesting, is that on the one hand, you know, it's true that if the Hessian is not positive definite, uh, you could have deteriorated convergence rates. And there's this simple example, x to the four, which shows that. On the other hand, if the minimizers are not isolated, the Hessian cannot be positive definite. But at the same time, when you run standard methods on, you know, many of the optimization problems that come up in practice, where the minimizers are not isolated, you tend to see you know, the right behavior, the good behavior. The algorithms do not seem to misbehave particularly uh, on, you know, on those functions that actually come up, okay? which naturally begs the question, well, it must be that those functions uh, 
despite having non-positive definite Hessians, they must have some other structure that you know makes those algorithms behave nicely. And it's a question that you know people have been asking for a long time, for decades, and several answers have emerged. And so in the first part of this presentation, what I want to do is simply go step by step over a few of the conditions that people have come up with, where they say, well, you know, if you're willing to assume that your function has this or that or you know that other property, then despite having non-isolated minimizers, you can guarantee that algorithms will have the right behavior. Right? And we can just look at some of those conditions. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll connect those conditions and, and show how they are related. Uh, and there's a rich history to all of that, and I'll try to pinpoint uh, some of the you know, so some of those uh, uh, historical pieces. The, does that make sense? Or do you have any questions or concerns at this, uh, at this point? Make sense? All right. So let's look at the simple example quickly uh, to try to get some intuition for, you know, why it is that algorithms might behave perfectly nicely uh, even if uh, the minimizers are not isolated. And um, you know, what are the properties that this particular example has that maybe we could generalize? Okay, I'll try not to belabor the point uh, with those simple functions. Well, let's just think of a function that is uh, you know, uh, in 2D, two variables, f of x, y. It just so happens that the function completely ignores y. It's just mu over 2 times x squared for some constant mu positive. Okay, and then the, the plot of that function is over here. As you can see, you know, since y is irrelevant to the value of the cost function, um, you have a whole set of minimizers, which basically says, well, you're a minimizer if x is 0 uh, and y can be whatever. OK, and so it's not isolated. Um, if you compute the gradient of the function, you know, this is what it is. If you compute the Hessian of the function, this is what it is. And what we see is that the gradient you know, completely disregards the y direction correctly, as it should, as does the Hessian, completely disregards what's going on in the y direction, again, which is the right thing to do. And because of that, you can sort of see that, OK, probably if I run a standard method on this cost function that's just going to manipulate gradients and Hessians, since the gradient and the Hessian don't care about what's happening in the y direction, probably the algorithm is also not going to care what's going on in the y direction. Therefore, it's really only going to see the x direction and the function along x is perfectly nice. And so you'd expect the method to you know, behave the right way. Okay. So based on that, you could say, OK, this function has, well, you know, it's very particular. So it has very many good properties. Um, but you could try to you know, play this game where you look at it for long enough and try to identify properties that it has that could generalize to broader classes. Okay? And there's at least four that you could write down. And I'm not going to uh, go into them you know, uh, on this slide. But what I'm going to do next is I'll have four slides. Uh, one for each, and for each of them, you know, I'll tell you what it's called, what, what it's saying, and, and a little bit about when it came up, all right? And then we'll connect them later on. Uh, but somehow, you know, this function has those properties, uh, and then those properties you can generalize to broader classes and then you know, ask how algorithms behave under this or that condition. Okay. All right, so the first one um, is you know top left, and the, the four conditions will always be here at the top right uh, corner. Uh, so the first one uh, I'll call Moore's bot. Uh, the story goes like this: You say, okay, if you know when I had isolated minimizers, um, I maybe would have been happy to assume that the Hessian at that minimizer was positive definite, and I know that if I do, things are great. Um, okay, fine. But if the minimizers are not just single points isolated, then um, okay, you need other assumptions. So maybe you could say, well, okay, the you know the minimizer is not a singleton, but maybe the set of minimizers is still a nice set. And okay, what are nice sets? Well, you could come up with you know, various answers. One possible answer to the question, what is a nice set, would be well, maybe it's a smooth manifold, right? Like a sufficiently regular set where you have you can do some you know calculus. Um, so the Moore's bot property condition assumption starts this way. It would say, okay, let's assume that the set of minimizers of my function is an embedded submanifold of Rn. And then we're going to assume that the function behaves nicely along that set of minimizers. Okay. 
And in the, in the case of an isolated minimizer, that meant the Hessian would be positive definite there, but, but we cannot have that anymore. So what, what else can we do? Well, we say, okay, at each point on my set of minimizers, it's certainly true that the gradient of the function is zero because they're minimizers. Um, and it's also true that at each point on that set of minimizers, the Hessian is positive semi-definite again for the same reason, they're local minimizers. But I'll pick a point x here, fix a point x on the set of minimizers. The gradient there is zero. And then move away from x, but while staying in s, right? s is a smooth manifold. So you can pick a smooth curve that stays in s and that passes through your point x. And along that curve, the gradient remains zero, right? Because the gradient is zero on the whole set x. So this means that uh, if you compute the derivative of the gradient along that curve, it's going to be zero because the gradient is constant along that so the derivative of the gradient is just the Hessian. So really what we're saying when we say that the derivative of the gradient along you know, uh, smooth curves on S is zero, what we're saying is that the directions that are tangent to S are in the kernel of the Hessian. So this is kind of a, you know, the minimal size of the kernel of the Hessian. The Hessian is positive semi-definite because it's a local minimum. But it cannot be positive definite. And the more precise statement to that effect is every direction that is tangent to the set of minimizers has to be in the kernel of the Hessian. So the, you know, amounting to a number of zero eigenvalues. And then the Morse bot assumption that we could make uh, would amount to saying, well, let's assume that this is actually all there is in the kernel. The kernel has to be this large. Let's assume that it's not any larger than that. Another way of saying that is, there's a number of eigenvalues that have to be zero. I cannot do anything about that. All of the other eigenvalues I'm going to assume are strictly positive, maybe bigger than mu or something. So that's the Morse bot condition. And it starts by assuming that the set you know, of solutions is a smooth manifold, and then you make this, this you, know, you add this. And if you're willing to make that assumption, then you can you know, study the behavior of algorithms, and you can find some things in, a, in the literature, though not a whole lot. Um, and maybe the reason for it is that it's maybe not, uh, you know, comfortable to start the whole story about uh, analyzing your algorithm by let's assume that the set of minimizers is a, is a manifold, right? There's maybe not uh, a very good reason for doing that unless you know a whole lot of things about your function. Okay. But this is one possible assumption you could make. And if you do, then you'll see that your algorithms behave well. Um, okay. Now, there's other assumptions you could make. Um, the next one is, is very popular. I'm sure many of you, if not everyone, uh, have heard about it. Is the polyak koyasi which condition? Uh, this has a long, you know, history uh, in optimization. It goes back at least to a paper of 1963 by Boris Polyak, where he studied gradient descent, and he said, well, you know, if your function is strongly convex, then you can uh, prove that the gradient descent behaves uh, great. But actually, if you look at the proof a bit more closely, you realize you don't really need it to be strongly convex. You just need a particular inequality that then later on took the name uh, or was given the name polyak which although it goes by different names, uh, depending on, on who you ask. And uh, the inequality is this one. It says, you know, if you are willing to assume that when you evaluate the function at some point x not too far away, everything in my story is local, you evaluate your function at some point not too far away uh, from a set of minimizers, s, then the difference in function value is going to be upper bounded by you know, some constant times the square of the norm of the gradient at x. So another way of saying that is if you find a point where the gradient is small, then in terms of function value, you're not doing too poorly. Right? If the gradient is small, f of x minus f of x star is small in some specific way. Um, and this is a, you know, an assumption that, that you, know, you might be willing to make. Uh, it includes strongly convex functions, but many, many more. Um, and, uh, you know, under that assumption, you can prove all sorts of nice things about algorithms, and there's many, 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 many papers, and I'm not going to get into, into all of those. Uh, although I'll mention one, and I'll mention it uh, two times more in this talk. Uh, there's this paper by Nestov and Polyak from 2006, where they considered uh, a method that is called the cubic regularization. So you know how Newton's method uh, has terrible behavior globally uh, and locally can be nice. Um, now, 
people have come up with different ways of globalizing Newton's method. And one of them is called trust regions and the other is called cubic regularization. And for cubic regularization, uh, Poliak and Nesterov, uh, they showed that if you're willing to make this assumption, PL, uh, they didn't call it that in that paper, um, then you can show that cubic regularization has super linear convergence. So they did not show quadratic convergence, right? But, but still good behavior for this method. Now I'll come back to this slide. Okay. So this is another assumption you might be willing to make, and this is compatible with non-isolated midline. Okay. So this is Morse box. Um, this one is Poliak OAC, which now we'll go to a, the third one, which is called quadratic growth. You know, yet another uh, assumption you might make. Uh, in this one, we're going to assume that if you move away from the set of minimizers, then the value of the function is going to grow you know, at least quadratically. And so that the function will you know, curve away from s at a sufficient rate, um, that uh, this is going to you know, somehow be helpful to your algorithm. Uh, this is really old. The oldest paper we could find it where it's sort of sufficiently explicitly written is from 95 by Bonos and Yoffe, but it's probably much older than that. If you know of an older reference, you know, uh, let, let us know. Um, the inequality is just this. You know, you just assume that somehow, you know, the distance between a point X and the, the sort of minimizers is uh, squared, is upper bounded by the uh, optimality gap in terms of function value. Uh, the nice thing about this assumption is that, you know, when you look at it, it only involves the value of the function and the distance to the set of minimizers. It does not involve a gradient or a Hessian or, or anything. So you can actually manipulate this assumption even for non-smooth optimization. Uh, and so you have a number of papers that show that for non-smooth optimization, if you're willing to assume quadratic growth, uh, you know, algorithms behave nicely. Okay, and there's many, many more. Yeah, question. It's the, yes, Euclidean distance to the set of minimizers S. And, and here there's no explicit assumption about what the set of minimizers looks like, right? So S is a set of minimizers, just distance to that set, projection distance. All right. Make sense so far? So one, one more, and then I think this is sort of the, the extent to which you can build lists and, uh, and hope that people you know, keep track of everything in the list. So fourth item, that's it. Uh, the error bound condition, yet another assumption that you might want to make about your function to explain or guarantee good behavior of algorithms. Uh, this one goes back certainly to a paper by Luo and Seng from 1993. Uh, and it looks like this. You assume that the norm of the gradient provides an upper bound up to a constant on the distance between your point and the set of minimizers. Right, so the norm of the gradient gives you perfect or, or rather control over your distance to the minimizer. This one's called error bound, um, pretty old now. And uh, you know, in that paper from 93, already Luo and Sang, you know, they analyzed like a plethora of algorithms and showed if you make this assumption, things are great. Um, there's a, another paper, and this is the, you know, the first um, time that I'm going to mention the paper of uh, um, uh, Poliak and, uh, and Nestorov again. There's a, this paper by uh, Manchung Yue, who's right there in the, in the audience, uh, Zhu and uh, Anthony Manchuso from uh, 2019, uh, in which they show that this, uh, this uh, cubic regularization algorithm I mentioned earlier, um, Poliak and uh, Nesterov showed in 2006, if you assume PL, you can have super linear convergence. And in this paper, uh, the authors show that if you assume error bound, you can have quadratic convergence actually. All right. Was that? No, no, this is a local. It's, it's all local convergence, yes. Um, the global behavior of cubic regularization is very interesting too. And this was actually the main point of the, the Nesterov and Poliak paper. Uh, but they also had a section about local behavior. Yeah. But we need to know the Lipschitz constant for the cubic regularizer problem is from this. Yes, so, so in, the, in the original 2006 paper, indeed, they, so they assume that the Hessian of the function is Lipschitz continuous, and then in the algorithm, that constant actually features. But then there's been follow-up papers, uh, a lot by um, uh, Coralia Cartes and, and, and colleagues, showing that, in, in fact, you can make all of this adaptive and you preserve all the rates. You don't need to know the constants, and it's, it's actually fine. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so, you know, you have these four conditions. 
And they're all different, but they're also all kind of look the same and, and you might wonder how are they related. And there's a, a number of answers that have you know, been provided. Uh, there's one thing that is sort of easy to see if you just uh, sit down and think about it for a few minutes, is that the Morse bot condition, this one at the top, it implies all of the others. And the reason for that is uh, it's kind of, Morse bot is kind of explicitly strong in its formulation because you start by assuming that S, the set of minimizers is very nice set, is a smooth manifold. And then you assume that the Hessian along that set has exactly the behavior you might expect, you, or rather you might hope for, meaning, well, the kernel, the tangent spaces are in the kernel, nothing you can do about that, but everything else is positive definite. Using everything that, everything that Morse bot has to offer uh, and a few Taylor expansions, you can easily show that the other three conditions hold. All of this is a local statement, right? Locally. Now, every time I draw an arrow like this, an implication arrow, what I'll implicitly mean is that, you know, these conditions, they hold with some constant mu. Maybe you lose a little bit in that constant, and I'll tell you a bit more about exactly what you lose. Okay, maybe the neighborhood where things hold is going to be a bit smaller, and I'll tell you a bit more in a second. Okay. So, um, you know, this particular implication already transpires uh, in, some, some, uh, in this, this uh, paper from 1995, but all of these implications are easy. Uh, it gets more interesting when you look at the other implications. And in particular, uh, the implication that PL implies quadratic growth has a, an interesting and rich history that I will not have the time to do full justice to uh, right here. Uh, but there's at least two ways that you can show this. One is based on the Akeland's variational principle and goes back to papers by Yoffe in 2000. And there's also a gradient flow argument based on like a, a way I see which inequalities uh, that goes back to papers by um, uh, Bolt and colleagues from 2010 and then you know, much more work that came in the, in the years after. There's some papers by Drosiaski and colleagues by Karine et al. PL implies QG has sort of been around and there's a rich history to that. You only need F to be C1 for that to be true, which is quite nice. Okay. Uh, you can also find references that will you know, tell you that PL and error bound are actually equivalent up to the fact that you might lose quite a lot in the constant uh, by going from you know, EB to PL. Uh, but other than the constant, already for a function which is C1, the two imply each other. Um, you can also find some work showing that QG implies EB, although without um, control on the constant. And something that we show in the paper with Quentin is that if you're willing to assume that your function is C2, then in fact, QG implies EB with essentially the same constant, essentially no loss in the constant. And then the more interesting bit is that in fact, PL implies Morse bot as well, if you're willing to assume that your function is C2. Uh, and this is the one where we were uh, ourselves more surprised. So there, there is a paper by Fihan in 2020 that shows that if your function is analytic, then and if it satisfies the PL condition, then the set of solutions has to be a, a nice manifold, a nice variety. Uh, but in fact, already if your function is C2, you can show that PL implies that the set of minimizers is a manifold of class C1, and uh, that the Hessian has the Morse bot behavior. It's a positive definite along the normal direction along that manifold. And so you see, when you look at all of these implications, in fact, if your function is C2, they're all the same. Um, the one extra bit here is that for C2, you can show that the constant here is also preserved, which was not the case for C1. Okay. So then when you look at those, you might wonder, well, okay, there's a number of these implications that hold for C1. We showed some for C2, maybe actually we're missing the, the mark and, and you could show all of them for C1, but that's not the case. Uh, here's an example of a crazy function that satisfies quadratic growth, right? It, it grows faster than the quadratic, uh, but it's only C1 and it does not satisfy either EB or PL because it has a bunch of critical points infinitely close to its star. Um, and then uh, for this implication here, so Chris, another grad student in the group uh, who was there moments ago, I think, uh, came up with this nice function, which is C1 and satisfies PL, but a set of minimizers is a cross, which is not a manifold of any, you know, any regularity regularity uh, form, it's not C1 anyway. Okay. So you really need, uh, if you're thinking about CK classes, you really need C2 for all of these to be the same. So a bit more precisely, a little bit more precisely, these four conditions, you know, with some constant mu, 
defined locally around a set of minimizers, what you can say is that if any one of them holds with some constant mu in some neighborhood of the set of minimizers, then actually all four of them hold with any mu prime as close as you want to mu, but not necessarily equal to mu, you do lose something in general. Uh, in a possibly smaller neighborhood, but you know, a one neighborhood for all of them, um, with the constant mu prime. So that's sort of the, the main statement of the first part of the paper, is that in fact, uh, if you have one, then you have all. And also, if your function is ck and k is at least two, and you have any one of those conditions, hence you have all of them, um, then uh, the set of minimizers is a ck minus one set. That's the, the first part of the of that paper. Um, the second part, I'll just uh, tell you a few words about on this last slide uh, to, to conclude the story, is that um, you know, what you want to do with those conditions is to analyze algorithms. All the way back to the beginning of the presentation, you have an optimization problem, the minimizers are not isolated, uh, hence you cannot assume positive definite Hessians, but maybe you assume something else. And then using that assumption, you try to show that this or that algorithm has good behavior. Fine. Um, and I mentioned a few things in the literature, uh, notably for cubic regularization, you can show superlinear or quadratic convergence depending on the assumption that you make. It's now clear that in fact, uh, since all these assumptions are the same, you can show quadratic convergence under any of them. Okay, nice. Uh, what's neat though is that once you sort of, conceptually what this illustrates is the fact that uh, when you go about analyzing an algorithm, if you only allow yourself to use one of those you know, expressions for the same condition, then some results might be more or less difficult to establish. But if you realize that you can use all of them and it's not a you know, stronger assumption that you're making, then somehow some analysis become more transparent and you can get stronger results. So one thing that we do in the paper in the second part is to show that for cubic regularization, you can have quadratic convergence, this is known, but you can also get uh, quadratic convergence even if you use an inexact subproblem solver, which is important in practice. And to establish that, we, re we really use all four uh, expressions. So that's one. And then two for trust regions, which is the other natural globalization of, of Newton's method. For trust regions, um, well, first of all, Somewhat surprisingly, uh, we argue that uh, if you use an exact subproblem solver, the method might actually fail. But if you use more pragmatic inexact subproblem solvers, then two things. One, with a very simple one, you can still show linear convergence, even with, with a non-isolated minima. And two, empirically, but this is something that's still uh, in the works, uh, in fact, we suspect that uh, you could still salvage superlinear convergence, but this requires more uh, investigation. Okay. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. I really like the equivalence. Uh, um, so from what I remember, these uh, results require line search stuff like this to be adaptive for the cubic regularization um, for, for cubic regularization there's uh, there's no line search so you you adapt the penalty weight in some you know trust region style but it's a bit different mm -hmm. um, however the sub problem itself that you need to solve is not completely trivial and numerically it's it's a bit sophisticated to implement okay yeah I mean uh, do you think you can take these conditions to the stochastic cases? Because like the growth condition, for example, uh, we know even for non-convex optimization is a necessary and sufficient condition for uh, SGD to converge linearly with constant step size. So I, I'm really interested in the geometry of this and how we can use it in stochastic optimization actually. Yeah, there are a number of papers uh, that study algorithms under those conditions and where the algorithm itself is stochastic. The conditions themselves are not stochastic, right? It's just something you assume yeah, about the, the loss. Geometry, yeah. And then uh, the algorithm analysis part is okay, somehow okay, okay, dis okay. disconnected. Yes, but there's this a number is, of papers is, about that. Yes, yes, you're right. This is, this is about the, the geometry of the loss. Yeah, about the landscape. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Questions? First of all, thank you for your nice presentation. <laughs> I have a first dumb question. Uh, how 
you pronounce uh, Poliak Lo. So I, I've been uh, told by uh, a Polish person that it's pronounced Wojasiewicz. Oh, uh, Wojasiewicz. Okay, so I, I was I was half like the first syllable was was good, but the rest was wrong. <laughs> And the second question is that uh, I didn't follow the importance of uh, the positive iteration in order to come in order uh, so that uh, the gradient descent converge. I mean, uh, what was the first uh, motivation for this? Oh, one? when I showed the x to the four. X to the four. Yeah. yeah. So, so just um, so. Okay. Actually, for for example, if we have some knowledge of the function, we can use some geometry ever gradient descent, and and that kind of algorithm enjoy linear convergence. What do you mean geometry aware? For example, uh, you can, instead of using a constant uh, learning rate, I mean the step size, you can use a kind of learning, learning rate which is proportional to one over norm of grade, gradient of f at that point. Oh, I see, yes. So, okay, so, so then uh, maybe two, two parts to my answer. Mm -hmm. uh, one is that um, the, sort of the, the broader point here was that um, if you look at the collection of convergence guarantees you can find about standard algorithms, mm -hmm. a lot of them, they would have you assume from the onset that the Hessian at the minimizer that you're converging to is positive definite. And, um, and then this function f of x equals x to the 4 is an example, very simple one, for why that you know, assumption cannot just be removed. If you remove it, you have to replace it by something else. That, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that, I mean, it's certainly true that if you have a function like x to the 4, no one's forcing you to use gradient descent to minimize it. You could use a different algorithm that's more attuned to the particular landscape of x to the 4. And, and uh, what, what you mentioned, presumably, is something like that. Mm -hmm. Just like you can uh, tune Newton's method to also you know, recover the quadratic convergence when you have double roots and all of that. Uh, so, yeah. That's it. Thank you. Okay, so, I had some questions. So, if you consider some generalization of this inequality, so for example, uh, you have f, fx minus fx star is greater than mu over 2, the distance to x to s to some power alpha. Ah, so to some power alpha? Yes. yes. So, you can, you can replace all this inequality by. Uh, uh, removing the two exponent uh, and using some power alpha, does the equivalence still holds or it's completely different? <laughs> ah, yes. So I, I don't quite know. So, so the, the top right needs so this uh, so called uh, you know, PL condition. Yes, yes. It's yeah. like a very particular, it's a particular case of a yes. Kurdika way I see which for yeah. exponent two, if yeah. you put exactly. a different exponent, you have something different. Uh, in the, these early works by uh, Bolt and colleagues, mm -hmm. They show that if you have, you know, KL, so the top right, but with a different power, mm -hmm. you do get some guarantee of growth. Uh, so QG, but not Q, you know, different okay. uh, power. Um, but uh, then whether or not you can have a full circle uh, equivalence, uh, I'm not uh, quite sure. Morse bots, since you're assuming something specifically about the Hessian, would likely only give you, you know, power two or, yeah. or, or better. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't know about the one at the, uh, at the bottom right, for example. Mm. Um, Quentin, if you want to add something to that, go ahead. But yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. 